All right, a couple of administrative things in the beginning. Um, midterm, you should have seen the grades. If you have any questions about them, let me know. If the microphone is acting up, also let me know. I can change to the other one. Um, the tooling assignment is out and has been out for a week. The deadline is next week. Uh, the idea is that you can look at one um, tool of your choice, try it in the context of the assignment and um, play with it and write about it. Um, it's extremely open-ended. It's more also a sneak way, sneaky way for me to learn about those tools because you try it, you write about it, I can read about it. Um, and then, um, about teamwork, um, I posted a survey and you saw an announcement, hopefully. Um, please fill out that survey. Uh, I wanna see how teams went. Um, the second part is anonymous. I'm not going to share this, but I wanna see whether there are problems in teams and whether I should follow up with some of them. So actually sharing problems with me will help you. Um, and I, I will help you to kind of work through team issues if needed. Um, uh, we can talk about issues in class or in smaller groups in the team or uh, just individually and so on. With that all out of the way, um, let me start ask my usual question. Um, what did we talk about last time? And with last time, I don't mean the midterm. What did we talk about before that lecture? Distributed operations, machine learning, data processing, right? M moving computation um, to batch processing and stream processing, right? So we, we talked a little bit about big data processing, big scale data processing and how you would use it in machine learning, right? And I think from my perspective, the main parts to take away are probably thinking about batch versus stream processing, parallelizing things, right, working with data at massive scale where you need to think about replicating things, um, partitioning data and so on. We didn't go particularly deep. Um, I think that we could do an entire lecture just on kind of big scale data processing. And actually there is one. Um, um, I wanted to give you kind of a way into to think about some of the buzzwords um, like data lakes and the lambda architecture and mutable data, kind of some of the ideas that are popular in the context of data science and kind of um, big scale distribution. Um, today is my last lecture on these more technical aspects. Today I wanna to talk about infrastructure quality and a little bit of DevOps. Um, it goes into a similar way. And I'm talking about a lot of concepts that I suspect you're more or less familiar with. So I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I hope I probably run out of time anyway, but I try to cover a lot of things, um, probably a little bit superficially, similar to the last lecture. If there's any of those topics that you would like to do more of, we will probably have an, a lecture in the end. I know a lot of you talked about kind of big scale processing of data when I asked what you're interested in, in the beginning, right? So if there are any specific topics, I'd be happy to kind of go into more depth about some of those things in the end. Um, we can also talk about specific tools um, or things in, uh, in recitation. Tomorrow we're talking about monitoring and recitation and different monitoring tools. Um, so today will be a quick overview kind of of the landscape uh, and some of the concerns. And um, I'm happy to dive into details, but I think it's also a lot of this is kind of standard and then there's a huge amount of tools to, to, to learn about. All right. Um, we talked about earlier in the class a lot about model and data quality. Model quality, mostly kind of prediction accuracy, but other, other qualities that we care about the model. Then we talked about some issues regarding risk and kind of what happens with wrong predictions and what you can do about this. But there are also lots of issues that can happen within the pipeline. You read about this in the reading, right? So there are lots of issues that can happen um, when you try to deploy a model, when you learn something, but something in the learning process is wrong. Um, and the danger there is often kind of silent mistakes. So it used to work at some point, you make a change and you deploy and something doesn't work, like the deployment doesn't go through or things like this. Are there any things 
that you have seen maybe in the assignment, maybe in some other work where some of those infrastructure issues came up, where you made certain mistakes and the model was kind of bad for a while because something wasn't working correctly, but it took you a while to notice or... Um, actually, in our case, um, the file loads were a problem. So whenever we were uh, getting a request, we were trying to load a file, which was around 800 MBs for every request, and which basically slowed down the all the responses. Okay. And it worked in testing, and then you had a problem in production, or...? Yeah, but so I, like, we did not test it directly. Uh, we... Did, Put it in production when we were testing it the delay was like around five seconds mm -hmm. but when we put it in production we realized the requests are coming as like below one second yeah and it started piling up and then it, it reached a point that till 30 minutes we were not getting a response so okay the things that i'm i'm looking for here mostly are things that used to work and then they don't after an update um have you seen any any kind of those issues well, is there something that you could speculate what would happen in your projects, for example, if you, if you continue to refine this, is there any issues that you could deploy a model and you might not notice some of the issues? But let me ask the other way, what could you speculate? What are possible silent mistakes that can happen when you update something in the infrastructure, when you update something in the model um, that could affect the production system? The, the latency could change in terms of like prediction latency and that could um, kind of have a downstream effect that's harder to pick up on. Mm -hmm. So for example, you learned a model on some initial data, but then from telemetry, you have more and more training data and the model gets bigger and bigger and the latency for some reason changes, depends on the model, right? But uh, it might take longer and what was fine before in testing now takes too long but you don't notice until customers complain, right? Um, could also, another thing that's often cited as a potential problem is that the size of the model gets bigger and bigger. And then at some point um, you run out of space on the target device and the upload fails, but it's still using the old model. It's continuing to use the old model that's still there. And then even though you update, you retrain automatically regularly, over time kind of prediction accuracy goes down. Right, so those kind of issues, there are all kinds of things. Um, you might extract the feature incorrectly and then use it at the wrong scale. And that feature might be useful, but because it's now extracting kind of weird data, it's essentially no, no longer used in the prediction, right? Things like this. Um, you might have more user in the telemetry servers overloaded, but you don't notice in some reason, right? Um, so. The point that I'm trying to make here uh, using stale data sets is also you're uploading, you're getting more telemetry, but for some reason you're still using the old data for training. Right? So there are all kinds of issues that can happen throughout every step in the data pipeline, right? So we're automating a lot of things in data collection and data cleaning and labeling potentially and feature engineering. Each of these steps, we write some code. Maybe it's just three lines of Python code, right? To kind of call a scikit-learn function to encode something, but still there's some code. And sometimes this is more sophisticated than others, right? Data cleaning code, data encoding code can be quite sophisticated. But even then model training, model deployment and monitoring, there's a lot of infrastructure out there. And you want to make sure that all of that infrastructure, all of that automation that you may rely on, on retraining things regularly, um, is actually tested and actually works well in production, right? And the reading that I'm coming back to in a couple of minutes uh, was precisely about this. There are so many things that you can test that are really about the infrastructure, right? Can you test whether you would notice when a deployment fails, for example? Do you get a notification, right? Um, can you test whether you're using stale data that you would detect this? Um, 
that you would retry if a database connection is down while training or something like this? Or would you just silently learn on the wrong data? Right? So lots of things that you can test um, that you can look for. Um, and let me skip a bunch of things here. I just want to race through a bunch of things that are kind of standard in software engineering about quality assurance, about testing. And a lot of these apply also to pipelines, right? Pipelines are not using models. We are actually writing traditional code. We are writing Python codes, uh, Java code, or so on. And that's code that we can test. Actually, I think in one of the milestones for the group project, I'm asking you to test your pipeline. So I wanna see some evidence that your data extraction code is actually robust, has been tested, that your um, data quality code has been tested, things like this, right? So I'm gonna race through this, but interrupt me if I'm going too fast or if there are concepts that you feel um, are unfamiliar with and I wanna know more about. I assume most of you have seen most of these things. So first of all, you can, when, when we talk about testing, we mostly mean automated testing, but by no means that's the only thing that you can do, right? So you can manually test things. Um, a simple manual test might be a safety drill or kind of an, a, a test for your monitoring system where you intentionally slow down responses or sl uh, stop responses for a second to see whether the monitoring system sends you an alert. Right, so this is something that you can test automatically, but it might be a lot of effort to kind of set this up. You might instead say, as part of our operations, once a week we are testing our operations, uh, our monitoring system, um, and that might be a manual process. So somebody once a week goes through the process, goes through the steps and checks whether they get a notification, right? Just want to make sure this is not out of the room here, right? So this is a potential option. Not everything needs to be automated, but automation is nice because you don't need this person to actually do this every week. Um, and then we have all these tools for automation. Um, we think of tests at different levels, unit testing of individual units, integration testings of putting units together, and system testing of looking at the entire system end to end and accepting testing is more demonstration doesn't matter for our purposes so much. Unit testing, I assume you've all seen, right? So you write, um, typically there's some test runner that can automatically run those tests. You set up some, some calls, you test a single unit, often a single function, right? Call that function and compare the result with the output. Every automated test and actually every manual test has these ingredients. You have some specification, something that you're testing and in contrast to kind of the machine learning component for a pipeline, we know pretty sure what should happen, right? If you deploy a model to the cloud, the deployment should happen. We have a specification for this. If you uh, do some data cleaning, we have a specification of what the precondition is, what the post condition is. This is traditional coding. You may have some parts where you use kind of data programming and some, some machine learning as part of those tools and then testing becomes harder. Right? So if you do some, something like hollow clean uh, that we talked about or some of these steps, um, but most of the pipeline code will be traditional coding and can be tested with traditional means. Right? So you have some sort of specification, you're testing in a controlled environment, for example, on a continuous integration server or on a test machine or on your development machine, um, but usually not on live data, um, or you could control this as well. You have some test inputs, Right? So you call a function with some parameters or you call the sequence of functions and you have some expected output, the Oracle. And again, since we have specifications, we can at least manually come up with the Oracle, right? If you're testing the monitoring service, we take the thing down and we expect to get a text message, for example, right? Um, there is an expected output and we can test for that. Um, you can test uh, code with dependencies. This is also fairly standard, right? So you typically, um, if you have some code, here's some code that gets some data from a stream, puts it into a data frame, and then learns a model. Uh, this is kind of all tightly coupled um, and part of a real system, but you can decouple this and you replace the original system with a test driver, right? So this is JUnit. Uh, you would say, um, you only take two steps out of this entire program and you test those, right? So you 
test that getting data from the stream and putting it into this table actually works with some cleaning. And then you still have the problem that you're potentially testing against a database backend. So what's actually in the stream might change from time to time. So in testing, it's a common practice to decouple what you're doing, look at a specific unit. And if the unit is dependent on something else, put in a stop or put in a mock element to, to stop out the connection. Here's an example of this. Um, instead of getting an actual Kafka stream here, we build our own stream that just provides some hard-coded data, right? So this fulfills the same interface as a Kafka stream. We can't hard-code against the backend, but we can have a backend interface. And then we have a mock implementation that just provides some fixed data. And with this, we can test this line of code here independently, right? We always give the same data into this in the right format. We mock this out. And this is a very common pattern that, um, before you had the code that you're interested in kind of between the client and some backend. What we're doing is we're replacing the client by a test driver like JUnit and the backend by something that we can mock or that we can replace with something specific. Make sense? So for mocking the backend, there's a lot of infrastructure out there that you can automate some of this, but you can also hard code this as you want here. Daniel, you have a question? No. Okay, you just unmuted. Um, so there are a bunch of things to, to mock these things. I don't want to go into details. Um, and you can mock the different parts as well. So not just the database connection, but also the data cleaning uh, object if you wanted to. And the nice part, so, so this is a kind of typical infrastructure here that you have both the client and the test driver using the same code. And then you could run the code against the real backend or against kind of a mocked up. Uh, backend. And the nice thing that you can do here is now you have control over how the backend behaves and the backend kind of represents a larger environment. So you can also check for robustness. You can inject mistakes. You can inject faults into the environment and check whether they are handled correctly. So here's an example um, where we're just testing that if you have the data, you're creating the database with any, without any, no, you're learning, sorry, you're learning on an empty data set, this should produce an exception, right? So this is a test case that fails if this one succeeds. And if this one fails with an exception, which is what we would expect, then the entire test case passes, right? This is just a style of how you would write this in Java. Every test case framework has a different way of saying, I'm expecting an exception to be thrown here. But Again, if you control the environment, you can do something like um, you get some data from the stream and the third time you're requesting some data, you're throwing an IO exception, right? So now you're simulating a, a stream that throws an error and it actually throws an error in an, a predictable way, right? If you test this on a real stream, it usually doesn't have an error. So it's kind of hard to test those error conditions, but you can inject this if you have a mock object here, you can control the environment. And with this, you can test, for example, that your retry mechanism or whatever mechanism you have for exception handling and recovery works correctly, right? So again, a very common strategy to test for robustness of implementations that you inject some faults as part of a test into the environment. If you mock the environment, that's usually easy. Um, and then you check that the program still works as expected uh, because you're testing essentially the recovery mechanisms. Um, you can also test um, error handling and that it's kind of localized and that it kind of still continues. This is kind of a similar example. Um, so, so those are kind of the things that I want to talk about kind of in terms of testing, in terms of pipeline testing. I think it's common that you want to decouple things, right? So you provide some data. You might think about providing not only correct data, but also incorrect data or defect model or, or things like this. Then if you automate tests, it's typically a good idea to look at um, some sort of um, test quality measure we don't really have a good way of telling you how good your tests are. There are a couple of different strategies. The basic one that most people are using is um, looking at some code coverage to see how much of the code is executed uh, by my tests. 
right? So you can see, are there parts of my code that have never been executed by, by any test at all? Um, it's a very simple metric. Uh, it doesn't assure correctness because it just see, checks whether a certain line or a certain branch is executed. There are a bit more sophisticated things like mutation testing, but they're rarely used in practice. They will essentially um, you're injecting faults into your program and you see whether the tests are sensitive enough to catch the faults that you're injecting. Um, but in general, there's always a kind of a hard term of figuring out, I've done a lot of testing, but is it good enough, right? So there's a bit of judgment involved and um, kind of hard to define uh, specific guidelines. When you're writing tests, it helps a lot to think about structuring your software to make it testable. So a traditional notebook is very hard to test because it's just one linear long block of code, right? So if you want to test this, it's very useful to extract certain cells or certain functions like data cleaning into its own functions, separate them, that you can call those functions, that you can unit test them, um, uh, things like this. Um, and then this was unit testing, right? Looking at the single step, something that might be in a cell of a notebook um, or the single deployment step. But you also typically take uh, care about integration testing and system testing. So whether the pieces actually fit together, right? An integration test, this is not a data science example, but it's typically something where you have multiple objects or multiple functions and you test that the output of one function produces as an input into the next function that the, the sequence of two or three function calls might work together. Or well, here's a poker example where we have both a poker object and some player objects. And when we call it a bunch of sequences to essentially play a game um, and see whether these three components work well together, right? Um, this is more than a unit test. It actually tests a sequence of functions. And you can do this similar thing in the data science world where you test the, that the output of the cleaning step works well with the input of the learning step or something like this. Um, Right, and then system level test, test would be essentially test the entire pipeline, right? So start um, a new learning process and see whether the model makes it into production or something like this. Um, you typically want to automate all of this. Um, so there's build systems that automate the building and the running of tests. Um, continuous integration is really nice. Uh, it will automatically trigger a build every single time. Um, I think I'm asking you to do this in your team. There are kind of cloud services that will run this every time you push something to Git, it will automatically run your tests. Uh, you can also set up your own infrastructure like Travis, uh, like Jenkins on, on a local machine that has a similar functionality, but it's all local. And maybe you have more resources available. Um, the main benefit of continuous integration is that the tests are actually executed. So every time you commit something, the tests are run, you can't skip that thing, right? So you can't just say, oh, it's late on Friday, I'm just pushing something and it's too late to, to run all the tests, it will take a while, right? These are actually run, they will produce reports, they will blame you if you broke the build, uh, things like this. Um, um, and it's also, this is, this is a screenshot of Jenkins. It's also useful to observe trends over time. So you can see how many tests do you have over time or uh, code coverage over time, how much code is in your repository over time, these kind of things, uh, just to see how you're doing, how stable your development is and so on. Any questions so far? All obvious? Um, last point here is testing the monitoring system is maybe among the most complicated parts because it's kind of in production observing something. Again, you can mock out um, certain things and then kind of test the individual components. But you're typically not testing the monitoring system as itself. You want to see how the monitoring system is working. So I think most of the time you kind of want to test this in production in some form. So fire drills, essentially. Um, just be careful about what you're doing, right? This is the same as um, I have chaos engineering here. Um, the idea is to minimize the blast radius. You don't want to be 
taking down your entire system just to make sure that the monitoring system works, right? But you want to see that if you take out down one instance, your monitoring system would notice, right? Or there would be a correct fallover. All right. So chaos engineering, I mentioned earlier, uh, Benya. Uh, yeah, I, I was just wondering if um, for the testing of the monitoring system, it seems like most of those tests you could do in some sort of staging environment, right? Like seeing if alerts go off and things like that to, to avoid production for some of that. Yep. Uh, is that true? So, yeah, if you don't trust the monitoring system itself, right? So if you're building a monitoring system, you could certainly set up an environment where here's a stream of log files and here's the expectation and just run this and I'm expecting a notification. Right, yeah. This would be something like set up a server, set up a notification service, monitor something, run it, stop it, and see uh, whether we assert that we actually received a notification. Right? I'm not sure that you're actually going to do this if you're setting up an off-the-shelf monitoring system. Um, right? But you still mm -hmm. want to see that, um, like for example, in your, in your case, uh, you might set up that in a homework or in the group project, you might set up to see um, how well is your service doing, right? So are people rating movies well that you're uh, providing? But if that suddenly doesn't work anymore or just picking up the bad ratings or something like this, would you be notified, mm -hmm. right? And I think you probably wouldn't write a test for this. Maybe you would if it's important enough um, that can be automated, but you can certainly do a fire drill. Right. You can certainly kind of stop notifications in some way, turn off Kafka or turn off the connection bet between Kafka and that thing or something like this and see whether you get a notification. Okay. Uh, depending on how production critical the system is. Right. And then chaos testing or chaos engineering is the entire discipline of kind of thinking about how to test in production, how to run experiments in production without breaking everything at the same time. Um, so there are a bunch of tools that allow you to do this, like the Simeon Army um, has a bunch of kind of um, tools where in the end in the chaos toolkit, you essentially have a way to describe experiments. So this is um, what happens if a ex uh, certificate expires on one machine. Um, so what happens here is you kind of describe what should happen by default, and then you have a way to figure out, are you still accessing this machine, for example, or is the certificate still working? And then somewhere here's a method to actually inject a fault, right? In this case, to swap a, a certificate with an expired certificate. And here you could see um, whether, um, sorry, uh, whether the steady state hypothesis, the monitoring system would actually detect this. Right, and the chaos toolkit, if you set it up correctly, will run this on only one machine, probably, and figure out that on this one machine, you would detect this problem, right? So it's kind of testing monitoring in an automated way in production, taking care that you don't do this on all machines at the same time. And there's a way also to roll this back and it's all automated, right? So it's automated tests in production. Make sense? Any more questions? Let me just, just one second. I just want to test whether the breakout room thing works as I want it. Yep, I don't need to worry for setting this up. Um, because now I want you to make an exercise. Um, even though this may raise bad memories, I want to talk a little bit more about the scenario from the midterm assignment. Um, this actual tool to my knowledge doesn't exist, but it's based on research that a colleague has been doing a couple of years ago. So um, he's been doing um, my young, uh, he's doing a lot of research on kind of using cheap sensors that might be in smartphones and so on for all kinds of unusual detection. So he had some work where he would um, detect certain forms of lung problems um, you would blow into a whistle and the smartphone the sensor, the, the, the sensor 
would pick this up and would diagnose certain problems. So it's not COVID, but it's something like this, right? So this was kind of the idea behind this. He's also using all kinds of other devices, um, gyro sensor for all kinds of diagnosis. The idea is that you have a cheap diagnosis device that you can use um, at home or in some areas where you may not have access to more expensive equipment, right? So assume you have some sort of cloud deployment or hybrid deployment where some part is on the phone, some part is in the cloud. And now I want you to go through this and think about um, infrastructure quality. I want you to go through the points that were in the readings. Um, so there's data set and there were seven things that you can test about data sets. There's test for model deployment, uh, development and seven things that you can test about this. Um, infrastructure tests and monitoring tests. I'm just going to put you into groups according to your teams. I want team one to look at the seven uh, data tests, team two to look at the model development test, team three to look at the infrastructure test, and team four at the monitoring tests. And spend the next 15 minutes in your group talking about if you would actually build this system, if you would deploy it, which what kind of testing could you think about setting up, right? So think about the things I just talked about, certain forms of automation, maybe testing in production, maybe, um, um, maybe some monitoring system and testing this. And then after 15 minutes, I, I call you back and I would like you to uh, just briefly talk about what you discussed, like what kind of things would you adopt? What kind of things would you test? What kind of things would you maybe not test because it's too much? Too expensive, right? So kind of keep it roughly in the scenario that we talked about, um, the scenario of the midterm that you're building this system, you want to deploy it from a research prototype into production, you expect maybe a couple of thousands or millions of users. Um, clear so far? Any questions? Last chance? All right, see you in 15 minutes. All right, all right, welcome back. Um, oops, some button. Group one, you want to start? Uh, sure, we can probably start. Um, so uh, looking into the data test part for our scenario, uh, we, we can certainly have certain schemas uh, for the data. So we were looking for the gyroscope data and the audio. Uh, these two were the input data for the use case and gyroscopic data is generally in double floating values. So we can have a schema. So if it is something like a string or a word, we can probably reject it. Audio files, we were a little confused because none of us have any experience how the audio files are basically stored, but we were assuming that we might have certain metadata related to the file, which can tell that it's an MP3 file or some other type of video, and we can reject on the basis of that. Uh, for features that are beneficial, we were discussing essentially that we can have uh, things like correlation metrics and uh, try to figure out whether... Uh, certain features are beneficial for uh, uh, in predicting the, uh, like actually uh, put in some weightage in, in the predictions that we get out of the model. Uh, no features cost is too much. Uh, we were not really able to come up with uh, this much since we were uh, generally using cheap sensors itself in that regard. Also, when you're using deep neural networks, there's not much in terms of kind of classic features. Yeah. Uh, because you're kind of using the raw data often. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we were not really sure like how much time goes into processing or something like an audio file. Um, yeah. So no, we were not really sure of that. Mm -hmm. uh, adhering to the meta level requirements, uh, I think we were, we did not have any points related to this. It, it just seemed like this, this particular part was not applicable to our problem. Uh, uh, data pipeline has appropriate privacy controls. So we, we had a little bit of discussion around the audio part. Uh, 
and we were and we want to avoid the PII uh, portions of things, but which is very tough uh, to identify from the audio. So, if if an or if a person is saying his, for example, his SSN on the audio, then it's a PII data, but that generally will not happen since we are just recording the cough part. But uh, we were discussing, can we just extract the coughing portions from the audio? But we were not really sure if it is really if it is possible. You might detect any form of speech and throw that away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, new features can be added quickly. Uh, we we did not we did not have much to add on to this part. Uh, we were a little confused, like uh, what kind of features may come into picture. Uh, would it be video? Like I don't know. Video can come. Uh, yeah. Not really sure. fe features are problematic in the sense, right? And then I guess the last one is similar. So, yeah. Um, uh, you might think of new data sources, maybe if that you also use a video or something like this, but that's a mm. massive step, right? So it's not just adding a feature. Um, all right, thanks. Um, group two. Yeah, so um, I think several of these are sort of um, generic anyway, um, but uh, just looking at them, so um, we're, we're talking about a, a deep neural net implementation. So we want to make sure that um, for model one, that all of the parameters were checked in um, for the entire neural network and all the hyperparameters in terms of, yeah. uh, and, and the biases would be part of so, those parameters. So, so hyperparameters probably in the architecture, right? Not the that would be the other thing, yeah. The hyperparameters um, and then the, um, we'd, we'd make sure that we indicated which library we'd use to train the neural network and what version of it. Yeah. Um, for the next one, um, basically, as the article describes, we would do A-B testing to make sure we're capturing user engagement um, adequately. And, and um, the, the previous uh, architecture that we'd set up to, to use different versions of the model would allow us to compare different versions to see how accuracy um, affected user engagement and, and broader, higher level um, okay. metrics. Um, for model three, um, basically, again, as they describe, we would want to use um, a utility, a hyperparameter tuning utility to see um, what, what we kind of had that resulted from it. Um, since this is a, a deep neural net, that would probably take a lot of time because we're training multiple neural nets at that point. So we would make sure that we kind of plan it out well in advance and it wouldn't be something we do every day, but on a recurring basis, yeah. uh, especially driven in the event of data drift and massive changes in data. Um, and I think it we'd may, also probably It retain. may not be the most relevant here again, right? So you probably okay. want to do some architecture experimentation, um, probably some tuning, but I'm not sure how far you want to push that, yeah? Okay, and the other thing we were thinking about was um, retain maybe the top three, the top N um, sets of hyperparameters, mm -hmm. which we could quickly try, um, you know, if there was a data drift or something, just to see if another version that we had saw in the past was better, yep. was better. Um, staleness, again, we would use A-B testing along with the older versions um, in the repository mm -hmm. as a comparative basis. Um, for the simpler model, we could either do like a single layer neural network or linear regression and the features would be um, compressed under principal component analysis. So we'd have fewer components as well. Okay. For model quality across data slices, um, I think some key slices we identified would be um, the, the country of origin of the user, um, urban or rural environment, um, age. Um, we want to partition our data into the different um, categories of, of each of those and ensure that the data was looking good through each of those and there wasn't kind of a, a wide discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, and then for uh, inclusion, I think we just want to make sure that we had um, a diverse set of training data that covered gender fairly and, and um, race fairly and so forth. Yeah. And from the assignment, maybe the different quality of sensors, uh, right? Those could be for data slices, mm -hmm. like cheap hardware versus more expensive hardware. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right, so all of things that you could consider and a lot of this you could automate and actually implement, right? So there's a lot of work there, but, um, and you probably don't want to do everything immediately, but yeah. Group three. 
Sure. So um, for the first one, um, we were thinking, um, so you could have um, two models that were trained, right, with the same infrastructure, uh, model A and model B, and given the same uh, input data, like readings from sensors, they should give the same output, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, for two, um, this is kind of tough. So we were thinking there's uh, two sort of cases here. So if we're using an external library um, versus if we're rolling our own implementation of um, uh, you know, the code that's sort of generating the models. Um, and so I guess in the former case, I don't know if we could rely on like the tests that are in the library. Um, I'm not sure we had anything like yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also not sure here. Um, I also don't, I mean, we don't need to do every step, but I think we should think about every step, right? Um, right. Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, and for the third one, um, for integration testing, we could sort of uh, test faults at each stage. So um, I guess other things we can do, um, we can test getting telemetry data from user phones, for instance, making sure that, that that's yeah. functional. Um, also deploying to each phone um, and make sure that collecting data from the sensors on the phone, mm -hmm. phones actually works. Uh, for model quality, um, we could have multiple validation uh, data sets, sensor readings, um, and compare. Uh, we can store like older versions of the model and then compare uh, as time goes on. And also we can look at the time it takes to deploy the model as well, since that's important in our scenario. And for uh, model debugging, um, we could use a small subset of the data uh, maybe specific to a certain type of phone or something like that. And, um, you know, debug the model if, there, if there's a problem with that certain um, phone or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, for six, um, this seems pretty straightforward. Uh, maybe just partition the, the user base um, to enroll out the models that way. And seven, I think, is pretty straightforward as well. Um, yeah, but somebody has to do it. If, right? <laughs> right, yeah. And also for, I mean, in a hybrid scenario, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, yes. And also, since we're using an app, it's, there's, some, uh, there's some latency there as well, yep. um, updating the app, so. All right, last group. You haven't talked about who should talk, right? Actually, yes, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Uh, OK, um, we didn't actually get to the end because we spent too much That's time fine. up front. Um, so we talked about um, dependency changes. Specifically, we wanted to apply a sort of chaos testing kind of model where we basically took down random parts of the pipeline um, we, th we thought that was important to also note, like, um, because a pipeline could be very, very long and mm -hmm. the dependencies could be very deep. So we wanted to see if there are differences to the end result as a result of something being destroyed very upstream. So that's one for modeling one. For two, um, because of this uh, context, we might get data from external third party sources like hospitals. We would like to make sure that the data that they're providing is um, of the same schema from each imp each input time. And we're also concerned with if the they're still like alive. That's actually part of the, the first one. Um, the third point, training and serving are not too skewed. Uh, we want to make sure that the output of the training and the serving, the production, exists in the same feature space and have a similar distribution. Oh, according to the paper, it should be identical, but we didn't really get what, what that quite meant. Um, for the fourth point, models not too stale. This is pretty straightforward to test. Um, we just look at the age. Uh, 
But one thing we did consider was we wanted to see if we think that there is a correlation that the accuracy generally drops as the model gets older. Um, but we also want to see if that is true in production. So we think we could also do a reverse shadowing concept where we take down an old model, uh, but we leave the, we still use the old model to generate predictions and see if the accuracy indeed drops over time mm -hmm. as new data comes in. Um, the fifth point is relatively straightforward. Just apply some numerical tests to make sure that the numbers are in the correct space. Mm -hmm. And then we did talk about the last two. All right. All right. I don't want to go into the details of these, but I hope what this exercise has shown you is that there's actually a lot of stuff that you can test, right? Um, they have this overview figure. Um, and I think traditionally, most people think only about evaluating accuracy of their model, right? Um, maybe using some A-B testing or canary deployment, but I think it's very useful to just think about, there are so many other forms that go into the infrastructure that need to be reproducible, that need to be reliable, and at least you wanna know when something breaks that you can fix it, um, right? Ideally, you wanna know this before. So I think this is useful to think about. I like this paper as kind of a guideline, right? Uh, they even talk about how they kind of within the company advocate kind of better practices by having this test score, right? Scoring the practices and kind of seeing how teams improve over time. Um, so I su suggest if you ever get into a situation where you're building an actual system, um, not do every single step, but think about these steps. Um, right? So, I have 18 more minutes and I want to talk about a few concepts, probably just briefly. This is something that doesn't really fit in here, but I wanted to bring it up. Um, there's a lot of things um, where you actually chain a bunch of models. So um, this is an example of an automatic meme, meme generator where you take an image, you detect what object is in the image, you get the latest tweets from Twitter about that object, you kind of do some ranking based on sentiment, pick the one and then overlay text on the image, something like this, right? So what you see here is that the input of one model depends on the output of a different model, right? Just in a pipeline fashion. And if you look at things like self-driving cars, they actually have dozens of models that work together in some different ways, right? So you have inputs like LiDAR and video, you do object detection, then you're tracking those objects, you're predicting the motion where they're going to be, right? You're doing things like lane detection. So all of these things produce some, feed, uh, produce some inputs to some eventual planning algorithm or prediction algorithm what to do, um, possibly also with multiple stages, right? And all these things kind of feed into each other. This makes things super hard to debug and understand uh, and test as well. What happens is that an improvement in one of these components may actually degrade the quality of the entire system. Uh, you may have non-monotonic effects and weird interactions here. You may have things where the object tracking was depending on some nuances on object detection initially. Maybe it was detecting certain objects particularly well and it didn't care too much about others, but now you improved it that certain objects are slightly worse detected, but others get better. So overall an improvement, but the entire pipeline kind of performs worse. Um, there is a similar concept in traditional software engineering called feature interactions. Um, where you have um, multiple things, multiple components that may interact with each other, uh, usually through some environment. Um, so classic example is flood control and fire control. Flood control in a building are these kind of devices that you screw on the floor to just see whether there's water that would connect these pins. Um, so you detect uh, flooded bathrooms or things like this. And fire control is the sprinkler system, right? Both are components that you can buy and test individually. You can install them in your building, but if you put them together, you might need to be careful, right? So if there's a fire detected and the sprinklers go on, you don't want the flood control to shut off the water in the building, right? So this is an interaction that is actually not visible in the software. You can unit test the individual components and they're working fine, but if you put them together, there's kind of some unexpected interaction through the environment. These components were actually not that modular and independent as you thought they would be. 
There are a couple of techniques to detect this through requirements analysis, through formal modeling and some testing. I don't want to go too much into detail, but in the end, the, and there are many, many of these feature interaction examples. The key message that I just want to leave you here with is that you often have these effects that you have multiple models and they may interact. And in this case, you can't do unit testing or evaluate models in isolation. You need to focus much more on system testing, right? Test the entire um, tweet generator or meme generator or test the entire self-driving car, maybe in a simulator, test these components together. There's some value in testing them in isolation, but just a local improvement kind of seeing that one mod that one component improves, let's ship it is not a good idea, right? So one component improves, Great, let's try to test the entire model and see, or the entire system and see whether it improves as well. Make sense? I don't have a solution for this. Um, I think system level testing is the only way to get around this right now. There's probably some work that I don't know in this area, um, but I just wanted to bring this up. In the last 15 minutes that I have, I just want to race through DevOps and ML ops essentially. I again assume that most of you have seen those kind of as buzzwords, right? As kind of the, the problem um, came from kind of an old tradition, kind of similar to what I pitched about data scientists and software engineers, that you have developers and operators. Operators are the things that are supplying the data centers and making sure that the service actually runs, right? And they they have different kind of backgrounds, different specialties. They focus on different things. Developers want to develop new features. Operators want to make sure that they're not uh, get called um, or paged in the middle of the night, right? That things run smoothly. Um, and traditionally, there's a lot of stories of how they were kind of fighting against each other, right? Developers were developing something, updating libraries, and it would work on their machine, and then you push it into production, and things would break because they haven't documented the library update or things like this. Um, and then there's kind of a nasty back and forth, oh, it works on my machine, why it doesn't work there, and kind of a slow process of releasing something. Um, DevOps is the idea to kind of integrate these and kind of create a pipeline, shared, no, shared vocabulary, shared knowledge, um, and better coordinate. So reduce the friction of bringing changes from development into production as kind of the key goal. And there's an entire tool chain around this. You look at the entire process um, to kind of give developers a few more tools and a few more responsibilities, but also access this heavily relies on automation and tooling. Um, let's see. Um, so common practices is that all configurations, including dependencies, including server settings and so on, are put into version control, that you can roll them back, that you automate uh, configuring systems, setting up systems. You deploy and test in containers so that the environment for the developer and the environment in production is the same. You automate a lot of testing, like continuous integration fits in here as well. Um, a lot of focus on monitoring, orchestration, automatic deployment, automating decisions in practice, operation decisions. Um, this often gets promoted together with microservice architectures, which is nice if you can decompose the system into many small systems that you can deploy independently, update independently, and there's a, the goal again is to release things quickly and automate things, take out the friction as much as possible to get quick feedback for developers. Make sense so far? Is this new to anybody? Should I explain a few more things? All right, there's a heavy focus on tooling. Um, this slide is a couple of years old, but it kind of describes tools for different tasks, right? If you actually look into this, you probably recognize tools in most boxes, um, probably not all of them. Um, there's a heavy learning load if you're getting into this field and kind of learning tools as you go. You don't need to know every single one, but it's useful to kind of in those boxes, be comfortable with the ideas of some of them um, and maybe use them. Um, you can look at this more in the slides and I have a larger version later with machine learning. Um, so continuous delivery is one of those aspects where you try to automate things into production, right? So essentially from committing to Git, 
it will trigger some tests and it will trigger automatic deployment. And maybe an hour later, this will be canary released uh, to the first users. And in a couple of minutes to a couple of hours, you have some feedback, some users see this in production. A bunch of companies do this, um, like Facebook and uh, Etsy and so on. They, they talk about how they release a new version every couple of minutes. Um, of their web service, right? You, as a user, you wouldn't even notice this, but this is extremely empowering as a developer that something that you are developing, you can push into production, you can see online tonight, right? Instead of waiting for a release next year, kind of classic Office or Windows or so would be released every three years. And if you don't make the release, um, you have to wait another three years to see your work in production. Um, so it takes out a lot of automated steps. Continuous delivery is the idea that you automate everything except for the one decision to go live at the end. And co continuous deployment also takes it, automates that decision, typically with some canary releases. Um, let me skip a bunch of these things. Um, so that's just the idea. And then a lot of tools in this world are kind of containers, configuration management. You've probably seen a bunch of those. Um, Docker is very common as container language, right? So you describe the dependencies, not only libraries that you're using, but everything that you need to run this, virtualize this, put this in a container. And then it's fairly easy to ship this container to different servers and to run it there, right? This makes it fairly easy to package a your software with all the dependencies and run this on in the cloud on the on your development machine and a bunch of other machines compared to kind of traditional um, virtualization software the key uh, advantage of lightweight containers like docker is that they are really launched quickly like sec uh, sub second launch time they are not kind of heavyweight mechanisms um, let's see and then somebody needs to decide what runs where, how many, how many uh, copies of a container run on how many machines, how are the machines connected, what environments do we need, how do we scale this? And there's a lot of infrastructure to automate configurations, especially if you have a bunch of servers. Ansible is a script where you can install software or make configuration changes on many machines very quickly. So here's a script um, that would, I think, install MongoDB um, so it creates a role, it kind of creates a log file, and it creates a startup file, so multiple steps. And then you can just say, deploy this to all our web servers or to all our database servers, and you just have a list of those, and a bunch of those might be cloud servers. Right? So instead of doing things manually and maybe forgetting to set up some configuration parameter, create a file somewhere, this is just automated. Um, Puppet is a very similar tool, but instead of writing scripts, uh, the same way you have a more declarative language where you say, this is how the machine lo should look like at the end. Like Apache should be installed, updates should have been installed. Um, there should be a directory here. It's just a slightly different philosophy as a tool. But in the end, you can also say this machine should have this configuration and will automatically kind of create configuration files, run things, uh, install services, run your Docker container, things like this, right? So it's really the automation things, applying similar changes to many machines. And these scripts are things that you can put into version control again. These can be reviewed, right? These are version things, so you can go back. Somebody made a change, applied this to a thousand machines. Let's go back to last week's version. We can actually see what happened. And then the next step is kind of container orchestration. Um, so this is the idea, Kubernetes is kind of the, the most popular tool in this area where you have just a bunch of virtual machines and you have a bunch of Docker containers and you figure out where do you deploy them. Like you want maybe you, you rent a hundred machines from Amazon, you have like 50 different services as Docker containers and you want to figure out, oh, this one Docker container should run on 20 machines, this other container on one, and I want to automatically scale things and so on. So Kubernetes is kind of this idea that you have a server that oversees all those virtual machines and knows where to, which server should run which container and how to route the traffic to them eventually. It takes a while to figure out how to run each of those things, right? So there's a learning curve attached to each of them. Kubernetes is actually quite high complexity. So for the homework assignment, if you want to use it, use it. But probably if you're not already familiar with this, it's 
probably not worth it for the movie scenario to kind of invest heavily in all this infrastructure, um, but it's out there. And then there's a huge amount of monitoring infrastructure. We're talking about this in recitation tomorrow. The thing where I wanted to get to is that there is a trend called ML ops. Um, that's kind of DevOps for machine learning, if you want. They've, it's, it's a buzzword. Um, it's framed in different ways, but the idea is like you had previously DevOps as developers and operators bring them into production. This is kind of data science and operations kind of support uh, data scientists when they're developing models, quickly deploy models into production, have some automation in the infrastructure and so on. Um, there are also terms AI ops that typically refers to using machine learning to make decisions and operations. That's something else. And data ops, that's more data analytics kind of in kind of data warehouse settings and so on. They overlap, they are not clearly defined, but um, think of ML ops as kind of a version of DevOps that targets machine learning. Um, from my perspective, there is conceptually, there's not a lot of new stuff here. It's similar ideas, bring things into production, automate things, provide common vocabulary, common infrastructure, but the tools change, right? So there are tools for pipeline automation. There are tools for versioning models and data. There are tools for data programming. There are tools for continuous deployment of machine learning models. So instead of pushing code to a Docker container, you might push a, um, a TensorFlow model to the Amazon cloud in a specific service for this, right? So it's more tailored models. Um, monitoring, I think, probably also doesn't change a lot. Um, so different tools. This is a different overview. This is just the AI tools under the Linux Foundation. So open source frameworks for all kinds of things. Uh, there's a clickable version um, if, you, if you go to the slides online. Um, so this is Oh, this is slow again. Um, but there are a huge number of tools for many different purposes here. And I should, this is too slow, I guess. Um, and this is again worth to look into what you want to do um, depending on, on what the specific task is. Um, let me see. So things for feature engineering, things for SQL engine visualization, pipeline management, and so on. And these are only AI tools or tools that are under the Linux Foundation, right? But this is by far not a complete set here. Um, only open source tools. There are a bunch of commercial tools in the space. Um, if you're interested, um, there's a link to a reading list it's a bit unsorted, but there's a huge amount of readings on ML ops. This is kind of a topic that draws a lot of attention these days in kind of this operations space. Right, so I know this was very quickly. I kind of did all of DevOps and ML ops in like 15 minutes. I just wanted to pitch this that this, this is out there. If you're interested in these topics, we can go through more details uh, later. Send me an email if there are specific things that you care about. Otherwise, I would suggest uh, a bunch of these are interesting tools that you could explore as part of the homework assignment on open source tools or kind of machine learning tools. Um, and maybe try in the, in the homework as in the group assignment. All right, any quick questions before I summarize? So I hope you got the idea. So today, what I wanted to push was really, we talked about model quality, data quality, and so on, but there's also the entire pipeline. And the entire pipeline matters. It's much more kind of traditional programming than a lot of things that we talked about. So you can use a lot of the traditional testing techniques that we know about, testing robustness, um, code coverage, and, and things like this. Um, we briefly talked about the lack of modularity and then all the DevOps stuff, right? The whole goal is to automate things, automate things at scale, get developers and data scientists to get their stuff quicker into production, get them quicker feedback, less friction. And in doing this, you automate configuration, you put them into version control. There's a lot of monitoring and a lot, a lot of tools. All right, 
that's all I have. Uh, in the next lecture, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about topics like ethics, fairness, and then after this, safety, robustness, security, and so on. So um, more specialized topics um, about certain qualities that we might care about. All right. Let me stop recording and then I stick around for questions as usual.